Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. This is literally the last session of the day. So really appreciate your commitment to join us for this session on navigating privacy compliance while securing generative AI applications. Um, this is actually an extended or longer version of a lightning talk we did on Monday. So we'll have a lot of time for Q&A towards the end. So very glad that you're able to join us. And we stand between you and a whole bunch of drinks and fun in the expo. So much appreciate you being here. Thank you. My name is Maitreya Ranganath. I'm a security solutions architect. And I work with large customers, primarily in the automotive space. And in today's session, I'm also joined by Sam. Hi there. My name is Samuel Weymouth. I'm a specialist uh, security architect. And I work with AWS industry strategic customers. Fantastic. In today's session, we'll actually impart on you some information about how you can think about data privacy as well as compliance. But first, I wanted to kind of start with describing the generative AI scoping matrix. Just by a show of hands, how many people saw this in the keynote or have seen a session that dives deep into that? So I see a few people. So what I wanted to do was kind of go through this in a little bit more detail, because this is actually going to be the thread throughout our talk, which kind of helps you think about different use cases of generative AI. It's a mental model. And like all models, it's wrong. But some models are useful, as someone once said. So we hope that this model is useful for you as you think about generative AI applications and how to apply that. So I'm going to start on the left. So this is five scopes in number. So on the left is scope one, which we call consumer apps. So this is a situation where you as a customer are consuming an application, but the, the way you're signing up for the application is using the consumer terms and conditions, which means that you're not, you don't have any specific agreement. You are, it's, it could be a free service, it could be a paid service, but what you're doing is you're actually consuming the service through consumer level terms, right? You don't have any specific agreements, right? So an example of that would be if you're using the consumer version of ChatGPT to experiment with, and so you're kind of using that without any formal agreement between your company and the provider of that, right? So as you can imagine, there are certain considerations that come out due to data privacy that might be unique to this type of scope, which may not apply or might apply in a different way to some of the other scopes, right? So that's scope number one, which is consumer app. And scope number two, which is what we call enterprise app, and the difference really is that this is where your company, your organization, has an enterprise agreement with a provider to consume or provide that service to your employees under the terms of the enterprise agreement. So this could be a situation where uh, you have an existing application. So an example would be Salesforce, where you might be using Salesforce to manage your customer relationships. And Salesforce introduces a feature which uses generative AI. Say, for example, it's, it's in this case, it's called Einstein AI. And you want to make that available to everyone who uses Salesforce in your company. And when you do that, you'll actually have terms and conditions that you can negotiate with the provider and then understand exactly how that application and feature will be made available to your employees. The terms and conditions will also lay out something around things like data privacy. What are they doing with the data that they collect and how they use that data? So these are important considerations that will come into your uh, purview when you use something like a scope two application. One thing to remember is scopes one and two are about buying an application. So you are actually purchasing an application and using that within your organization, while the later scopes, three, four, and five, are about you building an application, right? So once you get to scope three, what we call that is a pre-trained model. By that, we mean that you are taking an off-the-shelf model from a model provider. And that could be, again, an open source model, a closed source model. But what you're doing is you're building an application around that model. And that application has some use case. So an example there would be you're using a model that is provided by, say, Bedrock, the service. So it could be Anthropic's Claude model. You're not changing that in any way, but you're using the model as is, but then packaging that into an application that performs some sort of use case for your employees or your customers. So an example of that would be, let's say you have, you're an automotive customer, and you want to enable your field technicians to get to root causes of problems really fast. So they're a car comes in, it has some diagnostic codes, and instead of the technician looking up lots and lots of very fat manuals or searching for that, you kind of want to help them in a chat-based interface so they can actually say, hey, what are the possible root causes of this particular diagnostic code? And the system looks it up for them and summarizes that to them saying, hey, the diagnostic code means it could be one of these three things. Here's how you troubleshoot. 
here's how you fix, right? So that's an application that you might want to create and build and give that to your technicians. And that's an example of a scope three application if you take an off-the-shelf model and use that within the application, right? So you're not customizing the model in any way. But when you step into step four, and that's called fine-tuned or customized models, what you're actually doing there is bringing your information to change the model or customize it so that it's better at the task that you're trying to do. So if you go back to the automotive example, because let's say you're using off-the-shelf model that was trained on vast amounts of data, but not necessarily automotive data, right? It may not understand all the automotive terms that are very unique to your industry. So one of the things you might decide to do is say, I'm gonna customize the language model to make it specific to my industry by exposing it to the automotive glossary, so to sample transcripts that I have prepared, and kind of give it that contextual knowledge that it lacked, right? So that customization is something that you might do to create a fine-tuned model, and by that means, your application can perform better because the model has now been exposed to automotive terminology, right? So that's where you might use, again, Bedrock is a service that lets you do that customization on certain models, and you might actually do that to get a customized model. In fact, scope four in this pattern is the first time actually that your data as a customer makes its way in some form into the model weights, right? And that has some implications for data privacy as we'll see in a minute, right? So that's an impact of using something like scope four. And scope five on the very far right is actually where you do all the training yourself. So in this case, you're starting from scratch, you're training your foundation model yourself using data that you choose, right? And then you're actually becoming a model provider and you control all aspects of the application, right? So this is an example where you might be building a model which is for your own needs. You collect the data, you train the model, and you use that within an application, right? So again, on AWS, you might use something like SageMaker to do the training jobs. But the more important part here is from a data privacy perspective is you control all the data that went into the training process, right? And underlying that, you see the security considerations. So we have things like governance, we have things like legal and privacy, which is the topic of our talk today, as well as risk management and the controls that you apply, they will change based on which scope you're doing, right? Just by a show of hands, if you're using, are any of you actually using or have encountered generative AI applications? And how many of you are actually seeing apps which fall into one and two, like when you're buying those apps? Have any of you encountered apps that fall into one and two? Okay, I see a couple of hands raised. How about scope three and four, where you're building an application using foundation models? I see some people also raising their hands. Now here's the interesting part. How many of you have encountered situations where your organization is actually in scope five? You're building your own foundation models. I don't see a lot of hands raised. Actually, this is also reflective of our experience. We traditionally see a lot of customers working in scope two, which is buying an application, or three and four, where they are actually using or building an application using off-the-shelf or fine-tuned models. We rarely see customers that are in scope five when it comes to foundation models. Obviously, if you're talking about AI in general, like you're creating a model to predict something like failure for uh, equipment, it's very, very common for people to build their own models. But when it comes to things like generative AI models, like language models, image generation models, it is much more frequent for customers to actually use an off-the-shelf model and potentially customize that. We also encounter scope one, and many customers consider that shadow IT because your employees using scope one application might be fine if they're not using any proprietary data, but the moment they start using that with proprietary data, confidential data, that raises a lot of concerns because the agreement that you have with the provider doesn't actually cover this type of use case. So they might consider that closer to shadow IT, and they might want to be very careful about how they deal with that, right? So that's an important distinction. So, most customers, scope two, three, and four, few in scope five, and we do encounter scope one, but that's typically frowned upon because they would want to bring them under the scope of an enterprise situation by having agreements and contractual terms and conditions. Sam will talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So now having that sort of scoping matrix in mind, let's sort of turn our attention to data privacy considerations that apply to these different scopes. I'll kind of block up scope one and two together, and then we'll talk about three and four in the next, and then finally end with five, right? So let's take a look at that. 
So first thing, I mean, it all really begins with data. And this is actually not all that different. At the end of the day, when you're analyzing an application for data privacy considerations, you have well-established practices, things like data classification, privacy audit, and so on and so forth that you'll apply to any application. And in this respect, the fact that it happens to be a generative AI application is not all that different. Right? It just so happens that it has some functionality that uses machine learning and language models or image models to generate new content, but the data privacy considerations remain the same to a very large extent. And it begins with questions like, who has access to the data and why? Right? So in scope one and two, we are talking about a consumer or an enterprise application. You have to actually understand what data is in these applications in the first place before we even consider the fact that there is generative AI. Right? So what data classification was allowed within your organization to use with that enterprise app? So if we take our mind back to Salesforce, it might be confidential information about your customers because you're actually using the platform to manage your customers and manage their relationships. But it's important to acknowledge the data classification level that is approved for use with the application so that then you can reason about who has access to that data and why do they have access to that. An important point here is who has access to data. So typically, an enterprise application, again going back to the Salesforce example, will have role-based access control, which segregates data. So you might have different tiers of users in your company with different levels of access. An important consideration is to make sure that those controls also apply to the generative AI feature that your provider is giving you. Right? The other thing is, how are they using that data? So for example, if you're purchasing this application from a provider, what happens to the data you input in prompts and what happens to the data that comes back as responses, right? So you have to make sure that the provider has set those out in their terms and conditions and you as an enterprise are good with the way they are using that data. Important questions to ask them would be, if you use my data to improve the model or the performance of the application, is that restricted to my use case, or is it possible that some other customer might be able to query the same model and potentially get information from that model that was used to train it? So important questions to ask your provider, and they should set these forth in the terms and conditions, and you should of course have your procurement and legal folks, as Sam will describe, carefully look at those terms and conditions before they approve such an application for use. You might also want to know why they're using that. Are they using it to provide information to you, which is the use case of the application? Or does the use case go beyond to do things like them improving their service or training their models, right? So you want to be very clear on those. And finally, the where part, the location, right? So this is where considerations like data localization, the location of where the data is kept will come into picture. And any kind of transfer across boundaries will also come into picture. So again, your provider will have to tell you that the data resides in this jurisdiction, and then under your instructions or in these circumstances, it's going to be moved from this place to that. So those are terms that and aspects that you want to clarify before you approve an application like that. The QR code down here actually refers to a blog post where we have quite a few of these considerations written out in text form. You can take a photo or you can also have the slides after this. So we look for, have many more QR codes and rest assured that you'll have access to both the recording and the slides after this. So you can actually follow those and see the links that we are providing you. So we just looked at consumer and enterprise apps. So this is you purchasing an application. So now let's look at the attention towards using or creating your application. And this is the build part. And this is scope three and four where you're actually using either pre-trained or fine-tuned models. And the considerations are very similar. Remember, we started out with who has access to the data and why. This still applies. But there's one nuance here that we should mention, which is a pattern called RAG or retrieval augmented generation. Has anybody heard of that? OK, a few hands here. So the pattern there is your generative AI application will actually look up information that is relevant to the user's query into an indexed data source. That could be, for example, a vector database or a search system that can do semantic search. And what happens is that query gives back relevant information from that index, and that information is put in the context that goes to the language model in this case for completion by the language model. So in this way, even though the language model hasn't been specifically trained on your data, you're injecting that into the context and then making the model perform the task. So it might be summarize, find the best alternative, or give me the root cause as an example. Right? So this pattern actually then allows you to query your own indexes. So the important part there would be 
uh, is to make sure that you have access control on those prompts, that you, th those queries that you're making to your data sources, right? You wanna make sure that if a person X belongs to a group that has access to just this type of information, they can't actually get and query information from some other data location or data source which they do not have access to. So role-based access control and access enforcement and access control lists on those indexes is super important. The other part is how are you using the prompts and responses, right? You're building the application. You might be invoking a model behind the scenes. How does that model provider handle the data that is coming in as inputs and outputs? The data might have sensitive information. It might have PII. How does that model provider assure you that they are protecting that data, and what do they do with that data? Other things is, again, the same location aspect does come in. Where is the data being stored, and how is it going to be processed, right? So important considerations to make sure that you don't run afoul of data localization requirements. And finally, what is the source of your training data? This applies to the fine-tuning process, right? Remember, off the shelf, you're not actually training the model, but when you fine-tune, that's when you take some of your data and then change the model weights to represent that data in some way. So there's two important considerations here. Number one is you have to be very careful about what is the training data that you actually select, right? And this is for two reasons. Number one is, let's say you use some data to fine tune your model, and that data that you have somehow makes its way into the model weights. An important consideration is you can't actually go back and say, out of these 100 records that I used, I want to remove 10 of those because somebody has asked their data to be removed. Right? You can't actually do that given a trained model or a fine-tuned model. You actually have to repeat the entire fine-tuning process again because there's no way to kind of, unlike a database, you can't go to the model and say, drop these four rows, right? because it's spread across all the model weights. So this can be very cumbersome and very difficult for you to actually keep repeating by removing data. So selection of the data is really important. So something like somebody's PII, personally identifiable information, may not be a great choice to use for fine tuning as an example. It might be much better to use the RAG pattern to pull that PII out because that data isn't going to actually make its way into the model weights. It's just inferred upon and completed and then completely forgotten. The model is stateless at that point. Another consideration is this, that once you have trained or fine tuned the model, you can't actually segregate the data or the access to the information in the model. So if you had two data sets and you use them for fine tuning, there's no way you can actually segregate between them at inference time. You can't say, please answer based on only data learned from source one and not from source two, because that's something that the models can't do. They're monolithic in nature, sort of like a black box. So again, since access control is not possible on the fine tuning information, it's far better to kind of do access control at the retrieval stage than to try to do access control within the model, right? So this kind of brings us right back to say, the data that you use for fine tuning, you need to be very selective, and you wanna make sure that the data, the, the classification level is such that anyone that is allowed to infer against the model is allowed to see that data. So a rule of thumb here is, if there's any data that goes into the model, and into the model I mean makes its way into the model weights, you should assume that that data can and will come out through prompting, right? So that gives you that rule of thumb of saying the data classification of the model should be the same level as the data classification of the data that went into customizing or training it, as we'll see in a minute, right? And finally, as with any application, you have to be cognizant of the regulatory and compliance requirements that govern the use of data within your application. So this is not new. We have years of experience dealing with this. What we are recommending is you bring that experience to bear, the same talent that you have, to kind of think about this application as with any other application that you might be thinking about. And finally, this is the final scope, scope five, where you've self-built and trained your model. So the important consideration is you become the model provider. What that means is a lot of the considerations that the model provider had in the previous sections now become your considerations. So for example, you are now responsible for all aspects of the solution. So where did the training data come from? Uh, how did the training happen? Did you clean up the training data to remove harmful, bias, misleading content? All those responsible AI considerations are now part of your responsibility, right? And what's the source of your training data? Did you have the right copyright agreements, right use agreements in order to be able to use that data? So these are still part of your considerations.
And how do you validate that input data? How do you clean it up to make sure that it doesn't have any harmful data, it doesn't have any biased data that could bias your training process? So these are important considerations that come up in scope five. And now the scale of these considerations is very large because the amount of data you need is very, very large to create a foundation model. So this could be an important consideration to keep in mind before you embark on something like a scope five. So that's all I had to say. So the most important takeaway I would like you to have is data privacy considerations have existed for a long time, but what changes here is some small nuances around the fact that you're using a foundation model or a language model to do your job, and that's the main difference that comes in. But all the considerations and all the best practices that you've been using for data protection still apply for generative AI applications. Now I'd like to hand it over to Sam. Okay, thank you. Ah, there you are, I went on the right slide. So welcome to the final session of the day. As we said before, I expect you're all looking forward to getting uh, across the room to level 200 for something to drink and some fun. But before we do fun, first we have to do tough things. It's a bit like when you're gonna run a Gen AI project, you just wanna get stuck into the computer stuff. But before all that happens, you need to think about the legal stuff and the regulatory stuff. So um, when we talk about compliance, we're generally talking about a sort of multi-step process. There'll be some sort of standard or regulation you need to comply with. There will be some audit to make sure you've got the right evidence to show that you did something about whatever it is you're supposed to be complying with. And there'll be attestation due from an independent third party. Now, we're all familiar with those things in the security space and what we're seeing in the uh, regulatory space around artificial intelligence as a whole and generative AI as a subset of that there's over a thousand pieces of legislation being written across 69 countries right now. And that's based on OECD data on this particular topic. So it's a lot of churn. And between the time when this presentation started and when this presentation ends, a law will have changed somewhere regarding AI. So be on your toes when it comes to this stuff. Now, um, customers often ask us a question, or me a question. They say, well, is my workload compliant? And my answer is, well, I can't tell you. I'm, I'm, I've, I have a qualifying law degree from the jurisdiction of England and Wales, but I'm not authorised to give legal opinions on behalf of AWS or about your workloads or to represent Amazon's legal position on any matters. However, what we can do is if you ask me the question, how would we, what can you do to help us on our compliance journey to identify perhaps the, the right controls and map those to AWS services and features? Well, that's a different question. That's something we can help you out with. Or perhaps you might say, I've got an audit coming up against a particular regulation or standard, and whether it be something to do with an AI workload, a new regulation like that, or an existing standard like ISO 27000. Again, we can help you prepare for an audit, get the right evidence in place, so when the auditor turns up, you can have a successful uh, adventure with the auditor. And when it comes to artificial intelligence and generative AI, with all that legal churn going on, you know, we want your projects to be successful. So you know, we give you some strong recommendations here and action items you can take back to your place of business so that you can crack on with having a successful project, regardless of what your workload is and what markets and consumers you're trying to approach with these products. So um, key takeaway here though is, and you'll see a lot of these as I talk, um, the cloud center of excellence. Now, who's heard this term before? Put your hand up if you've ever heard of, okay, we've got one, two. Okay, the cloud center of excellence is a group that you build within your organization to help uh, make your cloud transformation go faster and be more efficient and be uh, better under control, shall we say. And uh, it usually involves stakeholders from perhaps HR, training, maybe legal, hopefully legal, and obviously computer geeks, IT people. Now. The recommendation here is to make sure you really do have somebody with some legal knowledge on your team because it's not just AI regulation, it's data privacy regulation, data sovereignty regulation. There are lots of things that you need to consider. And making sure there's a stakeholder on your cloud center of excellence, which you can learn about how to build one here on this link, um, will make sure that your projects uh, have the, the right information to make the right decisions early on in that life cycle and not suddenly get to the end of your project ready to go live and you find that your application may be banned in the European Union, as an example. So um, key takeaway there, center of excellence, very important. Um, now, 
as I said, I, I, I can't speak about Amazon's legal position on things, but what we can see through all these bits of legislation that are coming through the pipes in different countries is some themes developing. We've got six key themes, one of which we've touched on earlier, which is data privacy. And uh, the, the key thing around there is that uh, whenever you have uh, personal information lurking in an AI system or any other database or data source that you control, that you have gathered that data in particular, then there will be some data privacy laws going to be relevant to you somewhere. So um, the easiest mitigant for this is exactly what it says on the slide. Don't record what you do not need. And this is particularly important if I give you an example from the European Global, uh, sorry, General Data Protection Regulation. Because they have basic information, name, address, phone number, that's easy. Uh, then they have sensitive information such as uh, health information, any biometrics, uh, anything to do with religion, ethnicity, gender. These are all sensitive characteristics. And they require a lot more controls that are well documented, proven to be working, and be ready for regulatory scrutiny when they start looking into the stuff. So um, as I said, the easiest mitigant is to not record things you do not need for the purposes of your project. And to help you with that, uh, we have a couple of things that, again, will work if you've got a legal team involved in your CCOE. Firstly, the Information Commissioner's Office for the United Kingdom, uh, which uh, you know, is largely compatible with European Union law, has this really good guidance on the eight questions developers need to ask to make sure they're scoping their data correctly, not capturing things you don't need. And it doesn't make sense to capture data you don't need. You're just paying to store it and paying to process it. You don't want to do that. Um, the other points here are around uh, things that what well, AWS services can do to help you in these particular cases. So uh, Macy has mentioned that. That is really good at discovering personally identifiable information against a number of different data privacy laws and categories and countries. And then you can basically label it, secure it, or remove it, depending on what you need. And that's a really good way of preparing your data before you put it in a pipeline that's going to eventually land with creating your own RAG or LLM at some point. Other ones are examples of S3 uh, from AWS Labs, which is a practical example of discovery within S3 buckets of PII that you can literally forget it. So you can be partially compliant with some other GDPR requirements around data deletion. Other examples from the financial services industry, we have one specifically about uh, cleanse, and, cleanse, tone, and moisturize your data before you put it into your uh, machine learning data pipeline. So that's a really good example there too. And uh, last but not least, and we, we mentioned Bedrock, and we mentioned, obviously, Amazon have had a lot of AI services for quite a long time now, such as Comprehend and Recognition. And many of those have an opt-out. So when you're using those services, you can opt-out of having your customer data included in the training and improvement and maintenance of those models that those particular uh, AI applications use. And Bedrock does that by default. You have to opt-in if you want to improve the bedrock service with your customer data. So those are a couple of key things there. Um, and uh, as I said, you know, account teams are ready to reach out and help. And when it comes to scoping this stuff, again, legal team in the CCOE or some sort of representative who can have those conversations with your developers will save you a lot of hassle later on. The second key thing I wanted to talk about was transparency and explainability. And we see this, again, we see this in pretty much all the different bits of legislation that are coming along around the world. And if I focus just on the European Union AI Act, as one of the earliest pieces of legislation out of the box, um, they're super keen on a few key points. The first one is disclosure. Does your consumer, whether it be a B2C, like business to consumer app, or a business to business app, does your end customer know that they're interacting with an AI? And chatbots are a pretty good example of that, because many chatbots are AI-driven. Um, if they're interacting with it, tell them that. Make it clear in the website and the service terms somewhere in your contract with your customers. That's what's going on. Um, and then give them the option, if they'd rather talk to a human being, give them the option to go to a call center and interact with a real human. Because in the European Union, it's all about individual choice and protection of individual personal data rights. That's what GDPR and the AI Act are largely about. Um, the second key point is documentation. 
And we talked about, uh, you know, um, you've got data classification and you know where your data came from. Did you scrape it off a website? Is it your own data or is it data you've acquired from a third party? Um, where did it come from? And what have you done to catalogue and document that data that you're using as part of your AI or generative AI pipeline? Um, the data, sorry, the model creation process as well. Models, uh, a lot of people see them as a bit of a um, sort of a obfuscated box once they're trained. You can't really see inside them that much. But when you're training it, that's the point that you can look at uh, different metrics about how that model behaves and testing phases, rates of hallucination, rates of potential of bias that it's detecting statistically. And we actually have some tools that can help you with that. Oh, and there we go. So um, first of all, uh, ISO 20, 42001 is a relatively fresh standard from ISO on how to govern AI systems. So in terms of what you need to do, the documents you need to produce in order to satisfy a regulator, this will help you a lot. So industry neutral, you do have to pay to use it. Um, there, we haven't seen similar ones from the Cloud uh, Security Alliance yet. They're still focused more on cloud infrastructure sort of audit rights. Um, oh, I forgot to mention standard contractual clauses and the relevance of that. Um, with um, uh, scopes uh, three through five and the, the GNI scoping matrix, model creation and data collection are highly important and you're going to need to think about doing those things. With um, scopes one and two, where you're more likely to either be using a service provider for GNI services, or perhaps you have already built your stuff and you're being one of those service providers, the standard contractual clauses are critical, those end user license agreements about what you're prepared to support in terms of the inputs and outputs that you're going to be supporting with your solution. So that your solution does not produce outputs of an undesirable effect that may, in effect, create some sort of legal problem for somebody somewhere. Um, moving back on to the AWS uh, ways we can help you. Uh, obviously, we have the Bedrock service integrates really nicely with the AWS Generative AI Best Practices. And that's an audit framework in the Audit Manager product, which has automated uh, data collection so that you can demonstrate things you're building with Bedrock are built with best practices in mind. Um, and, it, and it maps quite closely to some of the 42,001 uh, audit controls, but there are other controls that it does have some gaps there. So consider that when you're looking at these tools. The second one is if you're more in the uh, scopes four and five phase and you're building lots of stuff and you're looking at using SageMaker. SageMaker does have a uh, feature called Clarify, which actually use uh, what they call um, Shape and, or Shap and Lime, uh, which is a bunch of tools you use to statistically analyze how a model performs. So you can get quite good metrics on its testing, bias rates, hallucination rates, and uh, general accuracy. So these are really good ways of being able to document your model so that you can present that to a regulator or an auditor and be able to convince them, yep, you've got control of this thing and you know what it's doing and where your data came from. And as I said before, getting your legal advisor or legal counsel involved in a cloud center of excellence to make sure these projects are scoped right can't hurt. Um, moving on, the third theme, the third theme. So automated decision and human oversight. And um, I said earlier on, the, the, um, the EU AI Act and the EU data privacy laws are quite closely intertwined because there's a strong uh, movement towards personal data protection in the European context. Maybe you're not planning on going to a European market, but there will be a data privacy law somewhere relevant to you and your customers, if, even if it isn't the EU ones in particular. But the trend that we're seeing from the EU, and the EU will be inf very influential on other bits of legislation in other countries, is about protection of the rights of the individual. And that's protection from harms. So these might be, for example, situations where an AI is being used, for example, maybe it's uh, you've built a system to aid a city with the allocation of social housing based upon uh, certain personal attributes of people. Uh, you know, based upon their income or things like that or where they happen to live within a city. So something to do with the allocation of social housing, maybe it's the allocation of social benefits such as unemployment benefits or access to health care. Now the key thing with all these examples is they have legal impact on a person. So if the AI makes the wrong decision, that person has got to have a course, a right of appeal to say that, okay, well the AI made a decision, I didn't like it, I lost my health care. 
um, where's the human I can speak to to basically get my application back on track? So consider very carefully, you know, the, the examples I've given are sort of public sector examples, but there are examples of this all over the place that impringe upon people's legal rights for maybe as a consumer to have a warranty repaired or a device or something like that. Or maybe they call a chat bot to get their washing machine repaired as it's leaking all over their kitchen floor. Um, you know, these are things that will have insurance implications and legal implications. So you've got to consider that. You know, it's not just a chat bot that can do things that will have a legal impact potentially. So the right of appeal is important and the right of human intervention is important too. So a consumer can basically say, I believe the system made the wrong decision. I want to have an appeal to it. I want to talk to a human about that. So think about those things. And, and discrimination, which is, is a tough one because we know using statistical tools you saw in section, four, we, section two, sorry, we could see that uh, there are some ways to prove a model is maybe a little bit biased one way or the other. And in that case, we need a human intervention to be able to say, that's a hallucination. That's not the right outcome for this person. We need to you know, an operator needs to be able to recognize that and take action on that. So moving forward, well, what could you actually do about this? Um, in terms of defining, uh, you know, how individual rights are affected by AI systems, this documentation from the Information Commissioner's Office is really good and highlights a lot of useful stuff about um, ensuring individual rights are maintained, particularly the right of appeal, particularly the right to say how do your model works and how it came to the decision it came to. Um, and the other one is, uh, you know, we've had human intervention and in automated processes ever since we've had step functions and lambda functions. So when you think about an AI workload or gen AI workload, it's, it's not just an LLM endpoint, there's an API gateway, there might be lambdas, there might be Kubernetes containers, all sorts of things as part of that process. And when you look at the data flow, there will be data as input, data as processed and data as stored. At each of those different points, where could you put a human operator intervention? to make sure that the data is an accurate and no way impacts upon the end consumer who actually put that data in there. So um, consider that, and step functions are a great way to try and implement those types of things. Four, regulatory classification. Now this is something that is, again, mainly the examples coming from the EU AI Act here, but they have a risk-based approach to analyzing or assessing workloads and there are workloads that are outright banned. Um, an example of that would be untargeted scraping of mass surveillance footage, unless you happen to be law enforcement. Um, other examples, uh, emotion recognition in the workplace or in school environments, um, frowned upon in the European Union, unlikely that you'd be able to get a workload approved. And as I said at the very beginning, we want you to be successful in your AI workloads and not run afoul of these laws because you know, your success is success for us as well. Um, but there's other ones, uh, and social scoring is another example of this too. However, there are also workloads that are not banned but are high risk. And again, it relates back to that previous point about does the system have legal implication on somebody if the AI makes the wrong decision? And these high risk things might include stuff for uh, fraud prevention, list brokering, uh, potentially uh, credit checking are examples of where you know, AI applications that will come along and they'll probably have generative AI in them as well, but these are important to make sure that they're um, well controlled and you can expect more scrutiny from regulators. So factor that into your project timelines, talk to your legal representation on your CCOE to make sure you've considered these things. And this could be for any target market you're pushing your service to. Um, so how can we help you in this sort of space? Well. First of all, I've got a link up there to the initial European law, which is a great one to read, and you can get a feel for it. And I haven't put one up there, but uh, the OECD uh, uh, Generative AI legal website is a great one to look at to see what the trends are globally. Depending on where your customs are, what your markets are, what your industry is, there'll be something in there that's relevant to you. So strongly recommend on that. Uh, the other one here is uh, we have a straight out list from the Information Commissioner's Office in the UK about what high risk pro uh, workloads look like. So this is really important. Review it, have a look at it, think about what's your project doing? What's your actual business model for your, your generative AI workload? And lastly, as I said, engage your legal counsel in that cloud center of excellence because they should be the ones who know and be able to give you a legal opinion Yep, we're going to be able to do that. No, that could be quite high risk for us as an organization. Then you can make those go, no-go decisions about is that project right for this market, for this consumer.
Um, five, two to go. Profiling, and this is a tough one because again, in the European context, it's all about personal information and they're really keen on protecting the rights of individuals. Um, I'm no longer an EU citizen, I'm based in the UK, we left, but we're largely operating in parallel with those laws as we maintain our relationship with Europe. And uh, the key thing about this is that any workload that, broadly speaking, analyzes individuals and their personal traits, particularly uh, sensitive personal traits, and uh, uh, will be subject to quite a lot of scrutiny by the regulator. This relates all the way back to data privacy and all the way back to cataloging your data and knowing what data you have and not storing data you do not need. Um, interesting example I heard today on the radio actually, I was listening to the BBC and they talked about artificial intelligence and dating applications and finding matches. And they were comparing that, would you trust the dating application more than you'd trust your own mum if you brought home somebody to the house? Uh, which I thought was an interesting example. I'm a little older than past that particular point in my life, but think about a dating application, it's a good example because it has lots of personal data and lots of what the European Union would say are uh, sensitive characteristics. So um, think upon that one. Think about what your workload's doing, and if you have PII, um, do you need it? to actually conduct the processing you want to do. Or maybe your workload actually really needs those characteristics to make a good decision about something. Um, so uh, coming up to the first theme we talked about, um, don't record unnecessary data. And the key takeaways here, uh, we have, again, another link from the ICO. I pick on these links because they're written in English and that makes it fairly accessible for people. Uh, specifically on automated decision making and profiling and profiling features very heavily in the regulations we're seeing today. Um, and of course, as I've said four times before now, legal counsel on your cloud center of excellence. Finally, wrapping up and landing the plane, we have safety. And to do something a bit different, um, this one actually comes from an executive order from President Biden. Uh, so safety is definitely very highly considered in the US. And, and generally speaking, the US is taking a bit of a different tack with uh, AI regulation to what Europe has done. The EU AI Act has been done in consultation with lots of friendly countries, including the United States. Uh, the US will probably take an approach that uh, is more likely to be segmented by particular industries rather than having a blanket federal all-encompassing law. But we shall see, as I said, this is a movable feast, so we don't know quite what the future is going to be, but that's what my crystal ball is at the moment. And uh, in the space, the things that are considered in safety are systems that are unsafe or ineffective in some way. And I guess the most obvious one that you could probably think of would be autonomous cars. Because any system that, if it fails, presents a danger to life or property, has to have proper testing and independent verification. That's what the executive order says. It doesn't say exactly what independent verification and by whom. That is still to be ironed out as this area evolves. But if your uh, AI workload or generative AI workload is thinking about autonomous vehicles, or another example I heard today about uh, robot companions for the elderly in care homes that may or may not be advising the patient when to take medication. Uh, those are really good examples of ones where if the AI makes the wrong decision, there's a safety issue there. Perhaps, uh, perhaps somebody might even die. So it's quite high risk. Um, so key things here, uh, review the executive order. It gives you quite a lot of detail about what the expectations will be in the space if you're thinking about those type of technologies. And um, again, and I've said it five times before now, and I'll say it one more time, engage your legal counsel and your CCOE because this will help make sure that you, know, you, you, you make good decisions about whether your project is go or no go for a particular market, for a particular consumer. And maybe you know, it, there won't be one size fits all in this space. As, as I said, there are a lot of countries working on laws in this particular space. So it's been a fantastic uh, festival of security for us and hopefully for yourselves as well.